Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Pain This Universal Conversation with myself and Welsh. We'll be talking about issues relating to starting your business. Are you a single mother and you found it challenging to start your own business? My guest will be telling you about her own journey. She's a woman white white activist and she'll be telling you about the struggles women go through and why she's so vocal about the issue. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about my guests. Paula Diana is an author, entrepreneur, woman rights activist, a podcast host who campaigned for ensuring women are heard and ending the pain of domestic abuse. She has a bachelor's degree in political science and institutional relationship from a university in Bologna, Italy. Before she got started into doing everything she does now, she used to work in support of the former Prime Minister of Italy, Roma Prodi, in his political campaign. She worked with him behind the scenes to help encourage women. A fascinating thing about her is the continuous support she has for single women. As a single woman herself, she understood firsthand the struggle women were going through, especially in terms of recruiting people to help them to look after their loved ones. She started an agency to address that issue. She'll be sharing some of the tips working women can do to learn and better help themselves. As an author, she's written a book titled Saving the World, how women can save this world, save themselves from this world to be better and add more value to what they do. She's a speaker and she speaks very vocally about issues. She thinks her personal experience has made her to fight for women's rights and that has been her mission. Female empowerment is much more than the secondary issue or the issue of a minority. It is the disruptive power that it will change the social system in which we all live. She'll be talking about why she's so vocal, so passionate about women's rights and how when women are included and incorporated into society, better things happen. Well, meet my amazing guest, Paula Diana, as she shares her story. And let us know the critical issues that needs to be done to better women, incorporate women, include women in things we do. So we overcome the pains and struggle and find our own voice. Meet my amazing guests. Well, hello everyone. Welcome again to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. As I said in my introduction, today's conversation is one I would just encourage you to listen to. If you're a woman, you're an entrepreneur, you're struggling, you're a mother, and you're thinking about how do you make it work? What next steps should you take to progress your life? My introduction will tell you a lot about my guests. She's an amazing woman. She's an author. She's an entrepreneur, women rights activist, and a podcast host. Meet my amazing guest, Paula Diana, as she shares her story. How are you? Thank you, Anne, for having me. I'm very well, thank you. And I'm humbled and honored to be your guest today. I, I love to share my story and eventually uh, be able to inspire someone. <laughs> You know what? You do that already. You are truly amazing. You uh, inspire so many people because you are so passionate. Everything you do, you just don't do it for the sake of, okay, I want to do something. You do it and you give it meaning. You give meaning into what women's rights is all about. You give meaning into what motherhood really stands for. It's not just done. You do it because you, you also do, you put investment into it. You start things off. For women to actually believe it can be done. So it's one thing saying, okay, women, yeah, do all of this. This is easy. But no, 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 you actually do it to show us it can actually be done. So before we get started, Paula, into all of your amazing work, if, if, if I ask you in a few words, who are you? How would you describe yourself? So I would say that I'm, uh, I'm a fighter. I'm a mother. 
and uh, I'm uh, I'm an entrepreneur who loves to create uh, uh, you know jo new jobs and been in recruitment my company I, I love also to match people and find the best talents around the world oh wow so uh, what, when you look at your hard work because you, you're also very hard working what was your background like growing up as a child so I, I'm not working because I had to uh, create everything that I have. Honestly, I, I wasn't given anything, even though I come from a family that was like a, a middle bourgeois, let's say that, in the north of Italy. But my family was quite conservative, uh, definitely, uh, you know, hardworking people, but they weren't so keen, you know, on uh, uh, helping or spoiling, especially the daughter, right? Because, uh, yeah, unfortunately in Italy, it's still nowadays, but especially in the past, they tend to be uh, quite misogynistic. So I wasn't the preferred child, let's say that. And I suffered about that when I was young, but I, I didn't want to play any victim role. I was like, you know what? I will build my own fortune. I will, you know, I, I believe in myself. I'm the best investment, you know, I can I can have. And, and I invested everything myself. So my education, and then I, I just, you know, uh, want to, to prove to the others and, you know, to my family, to myself that I could succeed. And, and, uh, and, and it's hard, as you said before, you know, it's not easy, you know, people eventually now they see me, you know, uh, with more free time, you know, um, mm -hmm. having the freedom also to speak up for women, you know, to have my own podcast and YouTube show. But of course, at the beginning, uh, especially when you launch, you know, uh, your own business, uh, you might know that it's very, very hard. So I remember I was putting my children to bed and I was working, you know, until midnight, until one or two in the, in the mornings. Or when I wrote my book, I was waking up every day at 5 a.m. in order to have two hours of peace and quiet at home when I could actually concentrate and, and write down my ideas. So yeah, it's uh, it's hard work. Uh, also, thinking now, you know, uh, when I'm talking to you, thinking about uh, my beginnings because I began in politics. Uh, so for five years, I was working behind the scenes, never up front, always behind, and it was hard work because I remember I was literally sleeping with my laptop, you know, on my, you know, my side table, and uh, yeah, with uh, young children. Uh, for a time also, again, in this, during this period in politics, I was also um, directing and organizing a, a political school for the Democratic Party that at the time wasn't still born in Italy. And, and we used to have these courses for students, uh, other students during the weekends. So I used to go there during the weekends. I was working, you know, to organize during the whole week. And then during the weekends, I was going there, I was bringing my children, you know, I was meeting the professors, the students. It was very exciting. I, I feel blessed. I had this opportunity because I met incredible people. Yeah, but yeah it was a hard work. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. But what, what I have to ask you is that because nowadays, a lot of young girls are, or young boys as well struggle to know what to go into. And I see from your thing, you went into international uh, relation in, in university. We, was was any of your parents in that sector? What led you to choose this subject to say, this is something I wanted to study? Actually, that was my passion driving me. And, you know, my, my parents always dreamt about, uh, about me uh, to become a lawyer. And I actually tried uh, and I started with law, uh, but it, for me it was so boring. <laughs> Even though I was very good, I, I really was fascinated by politics and political science, sociology, you know, and history, I love history. So I decided to change at some point. And, uh, and then of course I studied also uh, international relations and, uh, you know, uh, the political institutions. But yeah, that uh, was my passion. I, I really love to learn. And I tell you the truth, in the future, if I will have time, I would love to start studying again. I always say that. I could become a student at university again, eventually studying a new subject. I think, you know, we, we all have to keep learning, keep dreaming, you know. That's we're students for life. We, you know, I believe this is what we're called to. We, every day you wake up, you're students. And, and the only difference sometimes is it doesn't have to always be in the classroom. 
it could be, you know, every day you learn something that I had the classroom structured way. It's always missed. I love that. And I, I miss it as well. I have to ask you, you know, you work with the uh, former prime, uh, prime minister of Italy, uh, Roman, Romano Prodo. Uh, so he is well known. He's such an influential figure those days in Italy. And you were behind the scene, but you were working so hard with him to, um, you know, really get the gender question on the table. Can you tell us, because a lot of people, when they think of politics, not really like the toughness, the difficulty, the hard work that goes behind it. Can you tell me a little bit about work in the politic field and lessons that you took on to become the woman you are today? Yeah, that, that period was very interesting and I learned so much. And I also learned uh, what is the boys club because I saw it with my own eyes. So I was very junior. I was, uh, you know, a student uh, because in this, uh, you know, um, special business school at the University of Bologna, I, I did this master degree. And one of my professors, uh, Philippe Andreata, a great professor of uh, you know, international politics, uh, he, he gave me the chance to work for the political campaign of Romano Prodi. And I was referring to him and also other professors. They were all men. men. And, and they were helping each other. They were great people, absolutely great. But I remember when I was challenging them and telling them, why don't we call you know, a female speaker to this panel? You know, why don't we invite someone? And they were looking at me saying, you know, Paolo, we don't actually know them. We don't know who to invite. So they were always inviting you know, the same people, the same you know, uh, friends they knew. And they happened to be all very successful and famous men. And I thought, we have to change this. So I, I asked them to give me the chance, I still remember, to invite you know, female speakers at an event. And I said, I don't know them either, you know, but I, I was in my 20s, I definitely didn't know them. But I said, you know, I, I would call them. I would find the number and I would call them, <laughs> you know. And I, I literally did that. I started calling, you know, these uh, famous, you know, lawyers or professors or authors. And I actually found many of them. And they were lovely. They were actually very happy that I asked them to come, you know, and speak at our events. Uh, many of them eventually, they were busy, but you know, that wasn't stopping me. I wasn't saying, oh no, there are no women, because unfortunately this was the answer I received many times. You know, I would say, fine, you know, some of them, they're busy, of course, like men can be, but you know, that won't stop me. I will keep pursuing, you know, uh, what I want, because I, I believe it's, it's fundamental for us to have diversity and it's fundamental for us to give visibility to women. This, this, the connection between visibility and power is very strong. It's very strong. You know, you can become powerful if you're not visible, especially in this era, right? Mm. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I devoted myself to this, even though it was difficult. I'm sure my, some of my professors were even tired of listening to me, you know, saying that we, need, we needed more women. Um, but I wasn't intimidated by power. I wasn't intimidated by them, even though, again, I was so, you know, junior. I was just speaking my truth. And I, I think having a purpose in life makes everything easier. Yeah. So for me, my purpose is to really empower, you know, women and do as much as I can to uplift other women, you know, and uh, of course, good ones, you know, no one said, you know, we're going to uh, find bad ones, but it should be the same with men, right? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, that's not the case, right? Meritocracy is not the first thing, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm super I, proud you did I started uh, when I was a part of it and I kept doing that. Well, I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm so proud of you that you did that because I think this, this lesson you you brought a new light and it's something you see so often in so many organizations they always reach out to the same people and the new people never get the opportunity to share their voice and have be heard even though they're so good but um we need more people like you who could speak out in organizations like this let's just give other people a try because other people could be good and this is where then you could get gender black balance like get more diversity in an organization rather than just always sticking to the same people that you know so thank you for sharing that and i hope many people who might listen to this will understand that it's just sometimes you just have to shake the pot a little bit to reach out to new people i have to ask you also in martha and one of the things you you, you talk very passionately about is about junior divorce you know it's really hard being a mother because 
then you have to balance the work life then you know you know you really have to do things on your own and you said as a single mother you revealed the struggle and how difficult it was to find child child care and this is something we all talk about but sometimes we're not we're, we're ashamed to talk about it because we're like everybody we, we think in our mind everybody has kids so why are you complaining about it but you realize this is a big problem and you did something about it. Can you tell me what you did about that struggle you found? Yes, uh, it is a struggle. And, uh, and I decided to make a, a business out of that. <laughs> so it was actually, a, you know, the positive side was that I, I started from my own need and the need of a lot of my friends. And I decided to do something not only for myself, but for other people. Uh, of course, we get paid, we get paid uh, also well, but uh, uh, funding my company recruitment specifically for the, you know, house of sub and child care um, industry, I think it was uh, a good idea, especially, you know, starting in Italy many years ago, there was nothing like that, especially on a certain level. And uh, because, of course, for us, you know, standards uh, have to be very high. That's fundamental. And, uh, and then we actually uh, grow and now we have clients all over the world. Uh, and then we passed also on to the secretarial staff help because, uh, you know, how important it is to have a good PA, you know, a good executive assistant. And so all the help, you know, that someone uh, on a private household or maybe, you know, an organization might need, we, we find that. And yeah, everything started uh, from me being a mother. And I tell you the truth, it was hard, but it was the best gift of my life. I know your mother as well, so you can understand me. I, it really changed me. It made me a better person. Being a mother really, really made me who I am. Because everything I did uh, and I do, uh, I, I really do for my kids and also for the future, right? Because when I, when I think about uh, uh, you know, a world where they will live, you know, I want to leave a better planet for them. I want to leave you know, a better society, a more you know, uh, democratic and diverse and uh, you know, compassionate society. So that's why I, I keep trying you know to be uh, more vocal about uh, you know topics and issues that in my opinion they're fundamental to create a better society when you when you look at working mothers who are going through pain who are struggling juggling being a mother working what are some of the best tips you would give a working mother the best uh, thing that I can tell them is that uh, uh, children grow. Children grow, they become older, and then you know they won't need all the time that you're giving to them. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, because my, my children are grown up now. They're both, you know, uh, one even finished university, so it's already working. So you know, I, I can tell you at some point uh, it's actually good for you to have uh, your own job, your own career, you know, social life and everything. Because of course they need time for themselves. They need uh, to enjoy life. And this is what our society doesn't understand because uh, um, they, they, they treat women and mothers as they would be the same type of person forever. But it's not like that. We should be much more flexible you know, with mothers because the first three years, you, know, you need to give a lot of attention and time to your children. But then the more they grow, uh, eventually the less time they need. They need quality time for sure. And um, yeah, and, and they change and, and you change with them, right? So being a mother of a toddler is not the same of being a mother of a teenager, as an example. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think we need more flexibility and we need to tell mothers that maybe you can't have everything at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. because it's hard. No one said it's easy, but you can have it in the long term. You can have it thinking about you know, the big picture. So keep the hard work, don't give up and, and try to find, uh, uh, to build your own business eventually to become your own boss. That's definitely a good thing because of course it gives you more freedom and flexibility or eventually to find uh, a boss that is someone who can understand your needs. Someone can give you this flexibility to you. Personally, you know, I hire mainly women, honestly, and uh, many of them, they're mothers, single mothers, and I never had a problem. Actually, I am grateful for how good they are and how, you know, so, um, you, you, you know, they, they feel when you empower them, they're very grateful as well. So they give back a lot. 
I think it's motherhood is definitely a, a master degree in, uh, <laughs> in many, many subjects, starting from surviving. <laughs> no, that's really good. Um, when we look at female empowerment, because um, one of the things you're really, you're very vocal about is about female empowerment, about inclusivity of women in what we, everything we do. There's, there's that gap. And that gap still has not been addressed. No matter how much we've tried, uh, people have tried to break that barriers, they can't. How can we shape society today when you look at everything you've been through? Because you've quite experienced in this sector. You know, you started by your background working in politics, your, you know, you saw your own family, how they treated women, even though they embraced women, but they still had the um, you know, old in traditional ways of viewing how women should be that you broke all these stereotypes and everything. When you look at this, what do you think needs to be done in society today to shape the way women are viewed and how they could be included in society? We definitely have to start with education. We have to educate young girls that they can do everything. They can be anyone they would love to be because there are no limits. In the past, we used to have limits for women, right? We, should, we used to tell them, you know, you have to be humble, not so ambitious, stay at home, you know, be a good wife, be a good mother. Nowadays, we should tell them, you can be whoever you want to be and give them the strength when they're young, you know, so they, they will build this self-esteem. Self-esteem is fundamental. I see, you know, a lot of women that are struggling with self-esteem because eventually they weren't helped, you know, when they were young. And, uh, and we should help them to find that inner strength. I also call it the inner goddess because I believe we are all inner goddesses. And we just forgot about that. We forgot about that because, you know, religions during the centuries changed before there was Mother Earth. Then they, you know, uh, brought up other, you know, uh, type of religions, all male-centered. So actually, the second chapter of my book, Saving the World, is called uh, God is a Woman. And of course, it's, you know, it's very bold and provoking, but it's, uh, it's the way to, you know, to, to show that, you know, history and culture and religion, it's religion, you know, it's a firm, you know, type of culture we had. Uh, they were all imprinted by male dominance, male power. And that's why also women were submitted by these, you know, cultural um, uh, you know, uh, subjects and, and the religion. So that's why education is the first fundamental thing we have to touch in order to yeah, help women and girls to become more empowered. That's the first. Then, of course, there is much more. <laughs> Your book, you did actually mention your book, and this book was written in 2018 about saving the world, women. And you talk about this, um, the XSI. What number is that? Century factor for change in 2018. Century factor for change, yeah. And you have the key message, and you're given the history. First, you your book talks about the history, and you because I, I read a bit of your your. Um, synopsis of your book. It talks about history, about going back and understanding why, what, what happened to us, how do we get to this bit? So why, what did made you decide to put, not just be a vocal advocate for uh, women, but also put pen to paper and write this book? And tell me a little bit more about your book. Yes. So first of all, I love writing. I always loved writing since I was a child. So for me, being able to publish a book was a great, you know, uh, mm -hmm. milestone. Because a book is, it will be always there, right? So if someone wants to uh, read and go more in deep, you know, about my ideas, they can just click, you know, Amazon or <laughs> find, you know, bookstore, and they can have a more comprehensive, you know, um, idea. And of course, it was all the knowledge that I accumulated during the years, especially my, you know, university degree and then my political experience, what I saw. Also coming from Italy, you know, very patriarchal society, I would say the most patriarchal society in Europe. I think I can give that perspective to the world. I still have a lot of my friends who are shocked when I talk about the things that, you know, happen in Italy, really shocked. Of course, there is still much to do also here in the United Kingdom, in America, but definitely in the Western world, you know, progressed in a different way. 
mm. from other societies and and being uh, uh, you know um, an historian by you know upbringing I mean I, I just love to talk about history because you need to know who you are you need to know where you come from in order to understand you know who you might be and become and that's for women the most important thing you know because a lot of women unfortunately they i think they're stuck into the culture that permeates you know the the area in which they're living that's why when i'm positive about the future they all tell me oh why are you so positive you know it's it's not going bad this is going bad and i say listen if you look at history you know where we're coming from i can tell you things are going much better and they will change eventually would take 50 years, 100 years, you know, eventually we won't be alive anymore, but I don't care about that. I care about humanity, you know, I care about my grand-grandchildren, you know, uh, I care about the society, you know, not only about myself. And that's how I think all politicians should be. Unfortunately, they all have this short, you know, sight, and they only think about you in the next election, but I think to really change society and create something bigger, you need to think about the long term and uh, and definitely women are for sure 100 percent the biggest change factor of this uh, you know century when you look at um our institution around us in this world today we have the religious leaders we have the traditional belief we have the politicians and we have so many institutions that are very fundamental in the way they've done things and they're not ready to change. In your belief, do you think uh, as women, there are things we could do to us to help us in enter these, this world and help this world change these beliefs gradually? Because you know, change doesn't normally happen overnight, but do you think there's something we can do to get them to be ready to accept us? and start incorporating us in saying decision more. Yeah, I, I truly believe that each one of us has a huge responsibility, you know, in uh, the society and we can change. We can change, uh, you know, the world, definitely. And we should actually. And also nowadays we're all more connected because of social media, because of internet. So we should use that instrument in order to make a change. And yeah, never being different. You know, the worst things in history, if you think about, they happened when people were indifferent. They were indifferent about the pain of our people. Look at what happened, you know, with the Nazi uh, and fascist, you know, regimes. I mean, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. I, I still remember I heard a wonderful speech of uh, Elie Wiesel, you know, the former Nobel uh, Prize uh, winner. And he said that indifference is the mother of all evil. So, you know, you can't say, uh, oh, I didn't know, oh, I didn't, I, I looked on the other side. If you see someone, you know, suffering there or dying in front of you, you have the responsibility to change. Each one of us has a responsibility to change. That's why I always say, you know, we can't consider women, you know, empowered and free until the last woman or girl will be saved. And look what's happening nowadays in Afghanistan. Yeah. I think we are all you know responsible for what's happening there because we knew what was going on we knew that this is what happened we abandoned these people because of course they're all suffering but particularly women are suffering women are begging on the streets they, they can't work they can't be educated they can't eat they can't feed their children i read horrible stories about families who are selling their daughters mm -hmm. selling the daughters who are few months in order to eat Mm. It's unbelievable. It, it, honestly, it's, it's a huge tragedy. And we are all responsible for that. And yeah, and it's something I like that because it's something we, we all created it and it's something that we now need to know how we could all fix it together. When you look at the pandemic, because the pandemic has also caused so much um, inequalities as well. Uh, women have been the one held back to be at home to look after the kids or to do this. Um, and so that inequality is really shown with the pandemic. How can this inequality that the pandemic has sadly caused be bridged now that we've, you know, we're gradually coming out and becoming to accept that the pandemic might, uh, this pandemic uh, COVID-19 might be here with us for the rest of our life. So how do you think we can bridge this gap that has been caused by the pandemic? 
Yeah, it, it's very hard. Uh, we're coming from, you know, two very hard years for everyone. But we know that women, they had the, the biggest burden on their shoulders. Because yeah. still nowadays, also in the Western, you know, countries, women are the ones who are supposed to do all the chores, you know, have the household chores at home. And it's just so unfair because we weren't born with a special skill to use the Hoover. We weren't born with a special skill to clean the place, right? I'm like, we, we, we all have to learn how to do that. And uh, I don't know you, but I, I just hate to do that, right? Like I like doing that, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't have help at home, you just have to do, you know, what you have to do. And, uh, and men should do the same. So I think it's a good time actually for women to start becoming, you know, stronger even at home and just say, you know what, I have enough of this disparity. I've had enough of it. You know, you have to help with childcare, with you know, education, you know, with everything, because only in an equal marriage, I think you can thrive. If you, if you leave someone who pretends you to do all, you know, the unpaid work, also it's unpaid, can you imagine? It's just this is nonsense. You know, at least we should pay that, right? That's the thing. Even if they're going to be at home, make a job description then. Women should start giving their job description say, okay, my job description is I'm staying at home and these are the things I'm going to do because at the end of the day, we do the same to nannies anyway. So. <laughs> I'm so Well, like, um, I have to go into this bit about your recruitment firm, which is something that um, has just blown. It's doing phenomenally well. You're helping so many people across the world, um, US, United Kingdom, uh, Middle East, Asia. You're helping people in that recruitment phase to get people back to work. Have you seen through the lens, because yes, as if someone who's the owner of a recruitment firm, you're seeing things that we, a lot of people do not see. Are you seeing that through that, when you look at that lens, do you feel seeing more people openly now wanting to put more women and are you how are you helping prepare women to bridge that gap to get back to work yeah definitely there is uh, a lot of demand especially from uh, professionals and female professionals because they they understand the, the only way you know to be able to go back to work is having someone helping them you know at home so of course it's good for us it's good also for you know other people because you know we give work and you know, we, we the majority of them they're women as well, so the workers. Uh, I think it's a win-win situation for you know everyone. And another good thing I think is that um, you know they, they understand the clients that they have to pay good salaries because it's so important the job you know that they're asking and they want someone who is good in that and they understand the value of what they're receiving. So again, it's um, it's definitely. Uh, progressing in the right way I think because you want someone also who is you know happy you know to stay with your children to stay in the house you don't want someone who is depressed or unpaid you know or living a bad life so it's uh, it's a win-win situation for both clients and candidates tell me about your podcast you have a podcast yes yeah unleashed the game changers i i wanted to share with the world you know all the amazing people that i meet and who are truly game changers in my opinion because i believe that being able to change makes your life better you know change is inevitable first of all so there are people who resist change who suffer you know and people who embrace change who can eventually go through some sufferance but they will be happier in the long term, you know, in the long run. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it can be hard for many, many of us, you know, changing. And, and so I think it's good to listen to stories who can inspire us, can give us the courage to do that by ourselves, right? And, uh, and then try. Because again, you know, until you're alive, you should embrace, you know, change and, and think that you, you can can change you're able to change and there's nothing scary or frightening right actually it can be liberating it can give you another perspective on life you know so i i truly uh, love what i do uh, of course unfortunately because of the pandemic i had to stop i tried to do uh, some zoom uh, but i i really like the the personal you know touch and yeah yeah 
uh, and so I, I decided to uh, suspend for a while and now the second season is out so I'm really happy I can share new interviews with my guests and, uh, and eventually inspire other people that's, that's the goal that, and I uh, you know us, we always think we don't get inspired, but a lot of people get inspired by listening to other people's story, understanding how people did it, how they achieve such success. And it, you know, just gives people that you know that that realization and that hope that there is it can be done. My final question be, to you is that you're a big philanthropist, you love to help people, you you support so many different organizations. How does helping others bring you joy? I definitely think that giving gives you joy, only giving. Uh, I, I'm lucky because I'm not so materialistic. I mean, I, I love, of course, uh, to live well and have a you know a comfortable lifestyle and I love beauty. But I, I, apart from that, you know, I, I definitely value much more, you know, the connections with people, uh, the true love, true friendship uh, and, uh, and helping other people to, to thrive. I, I really think that's, that's what gives you the smile on your face when you wake up. You know, if you only think about yourself, eventually you won't be so happy. So I, I strongly suggest to everyone to start giving. Giving back is the key. Any final message you find that you go, Paula, because you're just truly amazing. Thank you so much. Any final message? Oh, thank you, Anne, for having me. My message is to um, follow my journey and uh, definitely follow me on Unleash the Game Changers because uh, I have very interesting guests and controversial issues. Another thing that I'm not scared of is talking about controversial you know, issues. I'm a tr true, true believer in free speech and uh, uh, free thinking. So yeah, stay tuned. I can't wait to see it. Let us know when that one is out so we could definitely be sharing a, a, the preview to our guests as well. Um, we would love to see it. I would love to see some of the controversial topics you have on, on, on in the pipeline. And thank you so much for your time, Paula. This is really amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you.